life. Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, welcome to this morning. And uh, we are here in uh, just outside of DC, in between DC and Baltimore, meeting with Dan Ash, who is currently the director, correct? Director or president, president CEO. CEO. So many different titles yeah, really. or elements that, that <laughs> give, convey the same. President and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And he was previously the director, this is where I'm getting my terms yeah. mixed up, of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Department of Interior. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you give us just a little bit of, you know, what is it you're doing today and kind of how does some of your background play into it? Okay, so the Association of Zoos and Aquariums is a, is a accrediting organization and a membership organization. So in order to be a member, we have 236 members today, you have to be accredited. And so our, in our, the AZA standards for a zoological institution are widely recognized as the gold standards worldwide. So the institutions that are members of the AZA are some of the most familiar zoos and aquariums that everybody would know of. The Monterey Bay Aquarium, the Georgia Aquarium, the National Aquarium here in Baltimore, the Smithsonian's National Zoo, San Diego Zoo, uh, St. Louis Zoo, and so um, they really represent the um, what is the model of a modern zoo and aquarium, which is a conservation organization that is kind of wrapped around an attraction. And so, um, and the um, they invest uh, annually, our members invest annually uh, more than $220 million a year in direct support for field conservation, so to conserve animals in nature. They do more than $25 million a year in research on animal husbandry and welfare. Um, and they host more than 200 million visitors a year, which for me as a lifelong conservation professional is is really the most exciting piece about being here because our members have an unparalleled opportunity to yeah. speak to a public about about wildlife and what uh, and the, the important things that everyday people can do to care for animals. Wow! And now, what what drives somebody to want to be a member? For those who don't understand the purpose of mm -hmm. the accreditations, and, because we do yes. this across multiple different areas, education is the same, um, and, and many other industries, but what is it that that, that does for the zoos? I, I think that the, th the thing that really drives them to be a member of AZA is a pursuit of excellence. So they, they're not required right, to, to right. be a member or be accredited even. And, um, but I think what really drives them to seek membership in an organization like AZA is their commitment to excellence in animal care, um, in conservation of wildlife, in guest service, um, because it, it makes them part of a larger community that they can learn from. Um, uh, and they, um, they compete, not in a business uh, sense, um, as a competitor, but uh, in terms of their the quality of the institution, I see what you're doing. I want to do that because that's really awesome. And so, I think the the main reason why they're a member of AZA is because they want to be better and better. They want to learn. They want to innovate, uh, um, and they want to be successful. Now, innovate is a word I really like. So, to talk to me a little bit about some of the recent innovations that you're start, starting to see uh, across the different zoos and aquariums. Uh, uh, some of them are maybe really simple, but really important. So, uh, what um, what our membership calls enrichment, right? So, I think the maybe the public's traditional view of, of a zoo, in particular, you know, would be this place with concrete floor and bars and. <laughs> You know, an animal that looks bored, and um, uh, but um, the um, but the exhibits of today, maybe I'll, I'll, another topic. The exhibits of today are kind of naturalistic exhibits where animals have space to move, and they uh, they can make choice. And so, our our um, members are innovating in this space of right. How can we give animals more and more choice over? what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the food they eat, the, 
the companions they have, if they, or if they want to be alone and away from other animals, they can make those choices themselves and they have enough space and diversity in that space um, to do that. But in a zoo um, or aquarium that is, has a combined footprint. So yeah. how I design space, use multiple dimensions in space, um, is, a, is a great um, uh, kind of environment of innovation today in the zoo and aquarium community. And then how can we enrich the lives of these animals by, um, by on a day-to-day -day basis exposing them to different stimuli that would just make their lives more interesting and actually make them behave more like an animal in, in, the, in, in the wild by exposing them to different temperatures, different scent, um, different companions, um, uh, different types of food, um, uh, uh, um, different toys or furniture that will, what, what they call furniture, um, that uh, just gives them a different environment and different stimulus. And the, and, the, and the effect of that for the visitor is a better experience because they see animals behaving like animals, like they do in nature. And they're, they're engaged and they're aware and um, they're active. And so I think that's a, a, there's a, a lot of energy and innovation going into that. And of course that, that really defines the, that really produces animals that are thriving, not just surviving. Um, um, in human care, but they're thriving in human care. So, um, so uh, just uh, probably one of the most important areas of innovation. The whole idea of technology and how we employ technology and blend technology with the with the live animal experience. And so, a lot of our members are exper experimenting with. Um, Augmented reality, not you know, not some some with virtual reality, really, um, but uh, but uh, many with augmented reality. So I, you know, I can, you know, this device can be a part of my experience at at a place like the Greensboro uh, Science Center, and I can I'm, I might be I might be seeing an animal, and then on this this screen I'm I'm seeing. I'm using virtual technology to learn about that animal, to, to see that animal in a different context, and so, so experimenting with technology more and more. Wow, so to be clear, the difference between augmented and virtual reality, augmented reality is when you have the original picture or view, and then you have information that is connected to it. That can be a highlighting, like look this direction, or it can be informational, where it gives you uh, access to more information. Virtual reality is when you oftentimes have like a head-mounted display and you're able to move within an environment. So these are often conflated. A lot of people don't always know the nuances of right. those differences, um, but we do it a lot in DOD. It's yeah. a very uh, key focus. And also, interestingly enough, getting into human behavior of choice. Yeah. So exactly as you said, um, if I were to translate that to education, as you've been talking about giving the animals choice, it almost is like you're talking about treating the whole animal versus necessarily providing basic care or access. And what we've been pushing in education is we need to worry about the whole human instead of simply checking the box that we've provided access right. to information. Exactly, and in our yeah. environment, the traditional kind of view of an animal care and welfare was, you know, do they have food, do they have shelter? Right. Um, and that's that certainly is care, right? That you're, you're you're caring for the animal. But the question of whether the animal is thriving means that I'm I'm concerned about their social right. well-being. I'm yep. concerned about their mental and uh, psychological well-being. Um, and uh, so a lot of our members' kind of energy and pushes toward innovation is learning more about that. And that again, that's a yeah. that's an important part of being part of a community like AZA because. It's a learning environment, sure. and, um, and when when um, someone at um, at uh, at Bronx Zoo um, learns about something that a, a colleague at Houston Zoo is yes. doing, uh, maybe with their elephant or cheetah, then they they go, well, "Why aren't we doing that here? Yeah. Um, that sounds pretty cool. Why aren't we doing that here?" Um, and then, you know, talking about the role of government um, in, in innovation, one of the most important organizations for our community and cultural, cultural institutions writ large is the Institute for 
uh, museum and library sciences. Okay. And, and we get a tremendous amount of support. Um, our members get um, grant support from IMLS um, that helps them kind of capitalize a lot of this work on innovation that's diff difficult to find support for elsewhere. So there's an important kind of blending of government and a really critical role for government in helping to drive that kind of transformation. Yeah, because one of the interesting things about government that, that I see is almost this misunderstanding of what is the role of nonprofits versus for business, uh, for profit uh, universities and research centers. And of course, you kind of cover both of these, right? The research yeah. centers and the and the nonprofit space, and then government. And what I, my opinion and observation has been that government is at its best when it's helping facilitate kind of this this yeah. connection. Uh, where I think we start to decline is when we start saying. Well, that happened in the Bronx Zoo, and that's in a different state. Mm -hmm. And that's a state-based issue, so we're not going to share that with yet another. And what you guys are doing is just, is just connecting. Because, of course, that makes Connect. sense, right? Then, yeah, <laughs> Diversity of ideas yeah, makes right. sense. And that's what AZA, I mean, when we ask our members, you know, about benefit of being a member of AZA, you know, certainly the accreditation lends them credibility because it um, associates them right. with, a, with, a, with a community of high performers. But then the kind of networking um, that then, and if you know, if we if we went online uh, on a computer and looked at, we have we have several hundred networks. So they're essentially communities of practice, um, and they're just always kind of asking one another questions across yeah. these networks. Well, we we saw this today. Has anybody else seen that? Or we're trying this. You know, tomorrow we'll you know we'll share our results. And so. There's just an active, very active communication going on across the community, which supports those, um, which supports learning and innovation. Right, um, right. And it, you know, and again, and it uh, it creates a, a, a competition, and not in a business sense, but in a in the in that kind of realm of idea yeah. and experimentation, because people, uh, it's a it's a community of high performers. They want to be high performers, and. It, and it's not just big zoo or aquarium. So it's you know you can it can be our biggest member like San Diego Zoo Global or Disney Animal Kingdom, or our smallest member like a Trevor Zoo in New York. And they're they're all you know talking to one another and learning how to be better. Yeah, a lot of times I say the big ones can give you information um, that is resource heavy or required. <laughs> But the small ones have that agility to try out things that maybe exactly. you, you'd have yeah. trouble to get through and, and right. pass through. And so when they work together, that's when we operate the best. Yeah. And I saw this a lot at NATO when we had multiple different countries. And there was an assumption as a large nation that we, we had all the answers. And what I learned very quickly was, no, they can do things we can't. Or yeah. they have information that we, would be very much a struggle for us to, mm -hmm. to get. And when we work together, then we have that benefit, um, we often call it a force multiplier, right? right? Yeah. There is there is that benefit. Now, change course just a little bit. I know you all also work um, uh, with the legislators, mm -hmm. and I read a little bit about that. So tell us about how, how you help speak for this group as well. Yeah, so, you know, once, uh, so we're, you know, we're a crediting body, so in a way we're kind of, we're a regulator um, and uh, of our community, and then, um, but once you are a member, we're kind of like a traditional trade association we represent our members and so that involves a, a lot of work here in the nation's capital working with the the executive branch because mm -hmm. we, we are we are also regulated by them so we're regulated by the US Department of Agriculture we're regulated by um, by OSHA we're regulated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service right. that I used to run um, and so we represent our members um, to the government, and and Congress is an important constituency sure. for us. And um, so, so we speak to Congress on issues of um, conservation um, of animals in nature. So we are defenders of the Endangered Species Act, and we work to encourage legislation that would support the conservation of endangered and threatened species. Um, we are very active in the animal welfare space because our members are leaders in animal welfare. So legislation, for instance, to, um, to ban the private ownership of large, uh, of big cats. Um, and so what we're, what we're 
saying is, listen, if 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 um, um, if you're going to hold a tiger or lion yeah. um, or leopard, um, you should be qualified to hold that animal, and that would seem logical on that point. Yeah. But and fair we enough. Should, <laughs> we should so we should just end the notion of private ownership of these exotic animals, and we should put those into the hands of professionals who know how to do it, and um, and and we should. Um, um, we should ensure the, you know, the the qualification to do that because it's a it's it's a welfare issue for the animal. Sure. Um, and you know we see a lot of um, organizations that are using and breeding animals for unethical purposes for you know photo opportunities right. or um, things like that. And um, and so we should just get out of that business. And and it's a safety issue because. Oh, yeah. These animals, we've seen many examples where these animals escape and they harm people. And so, um, so we're working with organizations like the Humane Society of the United States, and 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 I think that's important for um, for our you know brand as a whole is to show the American people that you know a modern accredited zoo and aquarium is it's a conservation organization, it's an animal welfare advocate, and so. Um, so we work to certainly to ensure that the animals that are at our member facilities are in excellent care, but we are concerned about animal welfare everywhere. You know, animals that are that are kept in, in inappropriate conditions domestically here and animals in nature everywhere. Right, and then so, I assume you all have the expertise then, should you come across these, right. to be able to bring them into the rescue. environments and, yeah, and, and rescue them. Yeah, rescue is a big piece of what we do, and I think you know, collectively I, 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 I would wager that our membership kind of rescue more animals than any kind of organization globally. And so you have an organization like SeaWorld, for instance, that just celebrated um, its 30, the, the 35,000 animals wow. rescued. And, and when you're talking about SeaWorld rescuing animals, they're mostly not small animals. They're right. like uh, whales and dolphins and manatees and sea turtles and sea lions and sea otter. And uh, so um, we have, our members are very much engaged in rescue. Mm -hmm. The National Aquarium in Baltimore just last year opened up a big brand new um, animal care and rescue facility that's kind of separate from the aquarium where they're um, rescuing sea lions and seals and turtles, sea turtles and um, so and they and that's our members putting their money into that right. effort and um, and so I think that's a that's a that's a big they see it as a responsibility of sure. theirs um, to kind of give back uh, to nature and um, but also, you know, working on an array of advocacy, certainly um, eliminating plastics. Um, and, and that's an area where, uh, again, our members are, are walking the talk. Um, yeah. Because at the same time as they're advocating for, you know, end of single-use plastics and, and things like that, they're doing it in their operations. So even big organizations like Disney and SeaWorld and... Um, you know, eliminating uh, single-use plastic from their business operations, and um, and uh, you know, smaller um, organizations like Buffalo Zoo, you know, eliminating plastic bottles um, and things like that, and so getting those things out of their kind of out of their waste stream, and so they're advocating for social change on a large scale, but they're they're making it happen locally by. By really demonstrating how we can we can operate more sustainably. So that actually segues really nicely to my last question, okay. which is that if you were to take your knowledge from being in government mm -hmm. and your past experience as a content expert, and now your experience here in this regulation space and, and research and conservation space, where you're connected to such a web, what where are the gaps? And what would you say are the top three things from an environmental perspective that we really need to focus on? Wow. Um, well, I'm <laughs> I'm a wildlife person, so um, so I have to put at the top of my list um, wildlife, and and that I think what the public today largely 
doesn't understand. I mean, we hear a lot about extinction yes. um, and these issues, but um, what I, I don't think the public really appreciates is the, the dire condition that wildlife is in globally. And just, you know, one, you know, brief kind of uh, illustration of that is if we, from, in terms of mammal life on the planet, um, if you look at human beings, which are, you know, mammal, um, and all of the animals that we grow to eat, that's mostly cattle and pigs, um, and all of the animals that we keep as companions, horses, dogs, cats, uh, mammals, um, uh, that represents more than 95% of the mammal life on the planet today in terms of biomass. So everything that we think of a wild mammal, a, you know, a, a, an elephant, a lion, a rhino, a raccoon, a rabbit, a rat, a, um, a whales, dolphins, all of that together represents less than 5% of the, of the biomass of life on the planet today. So humans and their ecology are, are the dominant life force on right. the planet. Um, and, and we have to come to grips with that. And so I think that what we have to decide very quickly is what do we want the future world to look like in terms of wild life. Um, yeah. And if we don't do that soon and aggressively, um, then there will be very little wild life on, left on the planet. That, that cannot live in the shadow of human uh, ecology. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, I, it, it's impossible to talk about the environment without talking about climate change. I mean, we simply have to address um, the crisis of changing climate. And because we are literally altering the kind of physical um, uh, properties uh, of the planet. And, and so, and, and, I'm, and I'm actually really, I'm confident that that will happen. The question is, will it happen soon enough to avoid some of the um, uh, potentially catastrophic consequences of changing climate? And, um, you know, that old um, saying, you know, a, a watch pot never boils. The reason is because it takes a lot to, to change the temperature of water. But we've now seen, we're seeing that changing temperature of the ocean. So we're driving, we're boiling that pot on a global scale, right? And, and, um, and, and so we have to change, we really have to fundamentally change how our economy, our energy economy operates. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I've probably been more confident than I ever have been that we will do that, um, but it's gonna require leadership by the United States um, and, and its fellow developed countries to do that. Um, and, and I would say just uh, uh, um, environmental sustainability writ large, and, and that certainly is related to the previous two, that we, we actually know how to live sust more sustainably. Um, we know how to make businesses more sustainable. Um, there has to be a commitment to that. And again, I, I think that's the responsibility of, of government writ large. Government meaning in our context, you know, the people, right? That, that, that we have to make a commitment to doing that, living more sustainably, um, making our businesses and, and our communities more sustainable. The, 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 the really cool thing is that we're, we are, there are great examples of how to do that. Um, we just have to make the commitment. Oh, I think we'll end right there. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. This thank was you. wonderful. Thank, thank you for you. outlining so much information. And thank you great. for what you're doing. Well, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> we, we We're need, all trying. We, we need courageous people to step up and help lead government. So thank you for thank what you. you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.